Well, hello everybody. Welcome to uh, today's webinar on monetary policy in transition with our Mario Centeno, the governor of the Bank of uh, Portugal. Um, Mr. Centeno is very well known in European circles. He has been, uh, as well as being a, a, an active and highly published uh, econ economist, especially in labor economics, he is a former finance minister of Portugal and is also the former uh, president of the Eurogroup. Uh, in his time as uh, finance minister in Portugal, uh, Portugal delivered steady growth, uh, a really impressive reduction in unemployment, and a, um, uh, a very strong reduction also in uh, government uh, deficits, in generating just for a brief moment a surplus before the COVID uh, crisis came along and upset all that. Uh, since uh, July 2020, uh, the, the, the minister became the governor of the Bank of Portugal, and of course, Pascal Donahue, the Irish finance minister, became the head of the Eurogroup. Uh, in terms of the Euro area and the Eurogroup, uh, Governor Centeno managed to um, bring together a consensus on some really important uh, reforms, uh, reforms that included um, uh, agreement on peer review of European economies, on common backstops and emergency provisions for, uh, for banking, on the uh, structure and future of the European stability mechanism. Uh, and I suspect that he had a few more things in mind if he had a little bit more time. Uh, but to generate consensus on such big issues in a relatively short period of time was uh, quite an achievement. Uh, more than that, Governor Centeno is known among his staff and colleagues as being the sort of rarity, a good leader who is also a real gentleman. Um, so it's a real pleasure to have him here with us. So uh, Governor Centeno, we leave the floor to you. Uh, please, uh, members of the audience, remember that you do have a Q&A button and you may uh, put questions in there for the governor and we will uh, come to those after his presentation. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Kevin, especially to you. Thank you for your very kind words. Uh, as usual, uh, we had the opportunity to meet at the ESM uh, and it was a pleasure to work, work with you uh, then. Well, it is also a pleasure to discuss monetary policy as governor of Bank of Portugal. Portugal is a proud uh, founder of the Euro. Myself, uh, as former president uh, of the Euro Group, uh, is for me uh, even a more special uh, occasion to, to be able to discuss these issues with you. The Eurogroup now, um, the, uh, the presidency of the Eurogroup is now um, filled by my Irish friend Pascal uh, Donahue. So uh, he's a very uh, good, a good friend of mine and, and, and an outstanding president uh, of the Eurogroup. And Ireland should be very proud of that as well. Well, it is a pleasure uh, also because uh, an Irish audience uh, fully understands the importance to protect and complete the most tangible symbol of being European, which is the Euro. And uh, the Euro uh, now enjoys the highest support ever among Europeans. 79% of the population of Euro area countries support the Euro. Uh, if you go back to 2013, the same figure was uh, only 62%. Let me insist in this uh, idea uh, of being among uh, an Irish uh, audience. I think it's also a, the perfect setting to state that the object that, uh, in my opinion, best resembles the euro is a rugby ball. I first used this idea when celebrating 20 years of the Euro in the European Parliament. And why is that, that the, the, the Euro ball uh, is appropriate to describe uh, the Euro? There are at least three reasons that come up to my mind. First, because the Euro, pretty much as a rugby ball, is difficult to handle. Second, because in the Euro area, as in a rugby team, we need 
to progress and to make progress together. No one can be left behind. And finally, in a rugby team and in the Euro, it is quite difficult to succeed with one man or country down. So what I propose to you uh, this afternoon is to play it fair, as only rugby players can do, and to discuss very openly monetary and fiscal policy alike. The policy response to the pandemic is a remarkable showcase of the power of monetary and fiscal policy interaction. It has always been there. It's embedded, indeed, in the economic laws and institutional arrangements. But this crisis has made clearer the benefits that may arise from their coordination. Europe was caught in debates focused on the theme of fiscal dominance before. In my opinion, this was the result of the poor handling of the financial crisis and its aftermath. In 2020, although the scope for additional monetary accommodation using traditional policy tools was limited, central banks have resorted to unconventional monetary policies. These instruments allowed them to circumvent the effective lower bound on policy rates and to guarantee a swift access to affordable forms of liquidity. Then, with the transmission mechanisms in place, it reached all economic agency need. In response to the pandemic, the ECB launched the new asset purchase program, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Program, the so-called PEP, but also a new series of targeted longer-term refinancing operations, the TLTRO3. And it has been a massive intervention. Between February 2020 and April 2021, there was an increase of 51% in the stock of original asset purchase program and the PEP taken together. TLTRO credit operations exhibited an increase of 242%. If we uh, take the numbers as they uh, show right now, the outstanding amounts uh, in April 2021 for the APP and PEP programs together uh, were almost 4 trillion euros, and TLTROs represent 2 trillion euros already. With such tools, monetary policy ensured the proper functioning uh, of the financial system in the peak of the crisis. Like in previous episodes, the latest financial crisis comes to mind. Market liquidity dried, in particular markets, immediately. Pressure was mounting, but prompt monetary action eased market concerns already in March 2020. Since then, financing conditions have remained favorable, supporting the flow of credit to the economy. In complement to monetary policy, fiscal policy played an immediate and crucial role in responding to the health emergency and to its impact on economic activity, namely on the financial positions of firms and households. As we used to say, uh, while policy, uh, monetary policy uh, decision makers, uh, monetary policy was not the only game in town this time. To reinforce the functioning of automatic stabilizers, uh, euro area governments swiftly implemented an unprecedented fiscal package whose direct budgetary costs are estimated to have amounted to more than 4% of GDP in 2020. In addition, member states provided ample support to counter the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. The largest category of liquidity support measures came in the form of state guarantees to support private sector borrowing. Euro area member states have put in place schemes totaling around 20% of GDP, although the actual uh, take up was smaller. But uh, we should not be surprised by that because um, some of these measures, especially these guarantees, were 
backstops uh, acting in, in fact uh, as uh, insurance nets. Initiatives in the European Union uh, provide additional support to the emergency fiscal response to the pandemic. The need uh, and importance of the fiscal support was recognized by the activation of the escape clause in the context of the uh, European Union fiscal surveillance, surveillance framework. In a first moment, the SURE instrument, uh, as well as financing provided by the European Investment Bank and the ESM pandemic crisis support instruments created leeway for national fiscal authorities to mitigate the fallout from the pandemic, while also providing effective risk sharing in Europe. And this is very, very important. After that, the next generation EU. The next generation EU inherits the spirit of the Euro Area Budget Instrument agreed in the Eurogroup in the last quarter of 2019. We used to call it BIC. The most important aspect of this extraordinary period of economic policy decisions that I was uh, privileged to witness in the front row was the ability to implement innovative measures to join efforts across member states and European institutions, and more importantly, to put aside old divisions and moral hazard concerns. Innovation, coordination, and solidarity describe the reaction of Europe in 2020, in stark contrast with the reaction to the financial and sovereign crisis 10 years earlier. Following a call for policy proposals from the Euro Summit in December 2019, we found appropriate solutions for the financing of the budgetary instrument for convergence and competitiveness. Discussions uh, on the need uh, of BIC, its objectives, design and modalities were lengthy and lively in the Eurogroup, but proved to be very insightful. The integration of the governance framework of the European Union and the modalities for non-area member states was part of the debate. The reflections at that stage were fundamental, I can assure you, for all member states of the European Union to have a clear picture of the added value of this kind of instrument and pave the way, no doubt about it, for the quick agreement on the next generation EU. The next generation EU is more than the support mechanism of 750 billion euros, more than 5% of uh, Euro European Union GDP, including uh, the European Union Recovery and Resilience Facility. To finance the 750 billion euros, the European Union will borrow on the market and issue common debt. Not, this is not only a sign of European solidarity, but also of uh, commitment and willingness to pursue the economic integration of the European Union over a long period of time. And why do I say this? Because the maturity of the instruments can reach 30 years. This is certainly not a temporary project. The reinforced capability of the European Union to successfully fund the next generation EU and to manage it in the following 30 years will set the ground for new and ambitious commitments. The crisis has evolved elsewise in, in economic terms and it's time to look ahead. The same applies, of course, to a monetary policy in transition. The paradigm used at the beginning of the crisis must be adapted. For that, the European Union funds will be crucial. The initial measures aimed at mitigating the direct effect of the severe lockdowns in the economic activity. Liquidity was the buzzword that we, we were all concerned about. We asked firms to stop production and people to stay at home. This is quite dramatic. In a political space known for the birth and development of the welfare state, the plethora of social policies adopted at the outset of the crisis, furlough screams come to mind, was only expected. 
Supervisors, fiscal authorities, and central banks made sure credit flow to firms in need. And credit and tax moratoria were applied in almost all countries of Europe. As uncertainty begins to fade, measures need to be adjusted, in particular to support the most vulnerable sectors and to mitigate potential scaring effects. But there's nothing structural in this process. Uh, it's all the result of the pandemics. These new targeted policies should be combined with measures that improve the fundamentals of the economy and support the green and digital transition. This is the European agenda uh, as of uh, now, and, and we must follow it. We should not fall, fool ourselves. The decisions taken in 2020, brave as they were, were simpler to design than what comes next. This is, of, this is of particular importance in a scenario of elevated debt that carry an additional vulnerability in our decentralized currency union. The absence of a fully consolidated public balance sheet exposes governments to a higher risk of self-fulfilling debt crisis. We worked very hard in the recent past in order to reduce risks, to expose ourselves now to these risks again. We don't need to raise old, old worries. We must avoid to revive moral hazard concerns that we successfully curb in the pre-crisis period with the reduction of NPLs, with the capitalization of European banks, with fiscal balances at their medium-term objectives in 14 out of the 19 euro area member states and public debt falling in all Euro area member states. This was 2019, not that long ago. The crisis was exogenous and no accumulated imbalances uh, brought us here. The monetary policy front is also challenging uh, as ever, but the grounds to its implementation are now also richer than ever. Risk reduction as described above, Facilities, facilitates the transmission of monetary policy because it reduces the risk of fragmentation. The completion of the institutional framework in the euro area is now much closer and will also reinforce the role of monetary policy. Monetary policy is expected to remain very accommodative amid a persistently low inflation environment. Forward guidance points to interest rates remaining at low levels uh, and the maintenance uh, of the purchasing program in the foreseeable future. A strategic review of the monetary policy is ongoing. We couldn't think of a better setting to debate the monetary policy strategy. The objective of the European system of central banks is clearly stated in Article 1 to 7 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. The primary objective is to maintain price stability without prejudice to this main objective. It should also support the general economies of the Union contributing to the achievement of its objectives. Against this, the discussion has uh, to be broad based and encompass the different elements currently at the core of the Union's policies. Although we have to proper balance the impact of any change, we cannot hide behind limited mandates. We have to be effective. We cannot afford a myopic view. Our midterm orientation has to retain flexibility to allow for adjustments as shocks are unexpected in nature and size. And 2020 is a great example of that. The lessons draw uh, from the current crisis and the decisions taken in the context of the pandemic are important and should be duly considered. The use of unconventional measures, that is not a novelty of this crisis, it dates to 2014, have proved to be effective, in particular concerning the challenges posed by the effective lower bond. They have been key in averting tail risks and easing financial conditions. 
a revised monetary policy strategy ought to retain many elements of the practice of the last decade, recognizing that monetary policy is a liquidity provision mechanism in a very broad sense is one of those elements, recognizing the particular effectiveness of monetary policy in moments of stress is another one. This contrasts with some perceived limitations of monetary policy in more normal times, at least to ensure that inflation converges towards a defined objective. On these, there are suggestions that makeup strategies would be very helpful. It is perhaps too early to conclude that this is indeed the case. Maybe a symmetric formulation for the price stability objective is more flexible than tying one's hands uh, as in makeup strategies. A symmetric objective means that when inflation is either above or below the objective, monetary policy will react to bring it towards the objective. Such a definition would convey the idea that we will act proportionally either when inflation is above or below the objective. Sure, this may not be enough to bring inflation back uh, to our aim. One option is to be patient and communicate it. Now that we've found that substantial monetary accommodation has effects on, on real variables, but perhaps insufficient effects on inflation. Our medium term orientation can certainly be used to accommodate such policy choice. Another and complementary avenue is to highlight further the overall success of policy and its profound effects on the course of our economies when tensions are acute. Highlighting our concerns with preserving monetary policy transmission and avoiding fragmentation of credit markets, arguably important conditions for the prosecution of the price stability objective, would help attenuate some uneasiness with persistent deviations from the inflation aim. And we have been observing this for quite some time already. Without prejudice to the price stability objective, this could come along with a clearer rule uh, for full employment and balanced economic growth in our policy. That would further help uh, aligning our concerns with those of the citizens we serve. But it would also make our strategy more con conformable with our actions, which include welfare criteria as a clear motivation. And I think it is quite appropriate to be so. Well, I hope these reflections can open up the debate. Uh, I am, of course, available to, to your questions, which uh, I uh, thank in advance. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you all.